Greetings and salutations. I hope your day is both tranquil and fulfilling. I am Athanasius, and welcome back to the podcast of the Boldly Immortal. Today I'm going to mess with a topic that I probably shouldn't, um, but have <laughs> have been wrestling with over the past few days, for the past few weeks, honestly, and I want to I want to work through this one so that I can understand all the nuance. And I think by by conversing with y'all, uh, I should be able to actually understand what I'm talking about by the end of this. But it's such a oh, it's such a radical idea. Um, it is such a a strange uh, concept in in my mind that that well until it until it actually codified that once it codified, I couldn't get rid of it, um, and that's kind of the problem. So. I'll give you some background on this context first, and I'll try and be as vague as I can. I've been serving as cantor, um, unofficial cantor. I mean, I, questions, what does that even mean? But I've been singing for my congregation, you know, as part of a uh, choral uh, supplement to, this, to the service. Uh, and this honestly came about partially because of COVID, a little bit beforehand, but um, when we didn't have a choir to do anything, uh, it made more sense to just have one person uh, singing stuff like the intro it, and um, that's the psalm at the beginning of the service, and and so that uh, kind of provided a, a supplemental uh, feature to the, to the service. And, and then um, that's continued, even though we have the choir available now, and so I, uh, I've been kind of wrestling with, well what, well, what does that actually mean? What is that service actually there for? And it, the trigger for this was that um, I am obviously a man. And then I was heading out of town for a few days, including a Sunday. And the first person that my pastor turned to to ask if they wanted to do it was a woman. And for a lot of people, that might not surprise them, but I th- I guess I reacted um, utterly surprised, because I frankly was utterly shocked that he would make that suggestion immediately. Um, and then he asked me, well, you know, uh, you know, what, what's, what's wrong with that kind of thing? And we, we got into a bit of a Bit of a conversation later, uh, which did not go well for me. I, I needed to uh, needed some reproof, um, I'll say, on on some of the positions I held in that conversation, and um, was was rightly reproved. And also, I uh, I've been continuing to wrestle with this idea and asking the question: Well, one, why did it shock me the first time? And two, was I right to be shocked? Um, and I think this ultimately comes down to how do we talk about men and women? What do we think about them? Uh, do we think that they're interchangeable or do we think that the human race has a beautiful binary reality of two different effectively subspecies, right? Where men and women are fundamentally different, biologically different and vocationally different. And what you have each one of them do signals something about your congregation. So that's what I'm wrestling with. How do you do this? How do you handle this in a broader context? Because it's it's frankly it's a hard it's a hard topic to to wrestle with, especially to talk about with women. <laughs> because generally speaking, women are gonna get more emotional about this. Um, I've heard from a very wise man that that his his wife can't really see that difference as starkly as he can. Um, and so it's harder maybe for them to see that men and women are fundamentally different in a lot of ways, right? There's biology, but there's also psychology. And there's also, I would say, spiritual, you know, that there are super rational parts of men and women that are are different. I mean, just imagine if you have a bunch of guys hanging out together, doing guy stuff, right? And guy stuff is code for a lot of stuff. But when you have a bunch of boys, boys will be boys kind of idea, 
doing stuff together, that's going to be pretty rowdy, a uh, little bit more uh, personal. You're going to have some jabs. You're going to have some some attacks back and forth. You're going to you're going to have some some roughness and some edge on that. Fundamentally, I mean, it's just going to it's just going to happen. There's going to be topics that you talk about that that might get a little bit personal, and you know might get a little bit offensive. They probably will at some point. You throw a woman in there and, and things change. Things get more polite. You don't get as offensive. You don't get as as harsh. Now, this is one of the reasons I like my sister. Because she doesn't take offense. She doesn't take as much offense. So, so we're able to talk about some of those offensive topics. But there are things I can talk about with my brother when it's just the two of us that I can't do with my sister around. She'll get she'll get the feelings hurt sort of thing, and she'll try and defend herself or, or whoever we're else we're attacking or you know whatever. She'll she'll get up in arms about it, and that's good. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a perfectly good and godly differentiation of vocation. There are things that my sister should want to temper when she's around us, and there are things that we should want to engage in when she's not around. Right, this was just this is just an anecdote from my childhood. I've I've continued to see this bear out though, especially in churches. Why? Mostly because church is like the only socialization I have nowadays. Thank you, COVID. Like legitimately, thank you. This is great. Church is my is my real community now, and you've you forced me there because it's the only place I can go and see people with no mask on. God be praised for that. Why? Because I have a religious objection to masks. I believe that they are a false idol that testify to the the worship of the current moment and the worship that our technology will preserve us from death, and that is a false god, and consequently I refuse to wear one in church, especially when I'm in the uh, the halls of Caesar. Well, you know what? Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Sometimes. I would really rather not worship any idols, but every now and then, given that that idol doesn't actually have any power, you know, this gets into Corinthians stuff, First Corinthians, and it's fascinating, really fascinating how we could wrestle with it. But I would say in terms of Colossians 3, we need to really rethink how we bear ourselves in the uh, assembly of the people. The fact that other people wear masks is a concession I will permit because of the sake of, well, I want to receive the sacrament. And, and I believe that these people are felicitously inconsistent or at least um, not not being not worshiping the idol but they're simply being um well misled by media um, i'm willing to admit that these people don't don't actually worship the mask but oh, man taking down the wrong road it could it could go there so as long as they are willing to allow me not to wear it well then i'd say they're not worshiping it and that's that's good um that was a big tangent, but it's something I've, I've been wrestling with, and I'll, I'll make a more more coherent point on that uh, later. So yes, thank you, COVID, for giving me one place where I can actually gather with other people, and it's been amazing for building fellowship there. Um, it's really, truly been a blessing um, to to have this one place that's that's holy. It is set apart for uh, for community and for for friendship and for brotherhood and, and all these great things. So yeah, but you see in that environment. When when you watch how people group together in your church, look at the gender dynamics, and then if you get the chance, listen to the conversations that are had. If you if you get the chance to listen in on two guys chatting, they're going to be talking about something. If, if you get to, the chance to listen to two guys chatting away from the women, oh yeah, there's going to be some interesting stuff that goes on there. Now, it might not because they might still feel that, that you know, common space, but you know, generally speaking, there will be a different difference in tenor. Um, if you're a woman, walk up to them and see how quickly the tenor changes. Oh yeah, oh it'll it'll change right quick, um, unless they're desensitized to this and they actually treat you the way you think that you want to be treated, which is like a dude, which you don't want. Trust me, trust me, you don't want that. That's gonna. I mean, maybe we need that. I'll, I'll get to that later. So I've been wrestling with. Well, we have these differences. Men and women have these differences in how they communicate and how they think and how they interact with one another. Some are basic bio biology, right? Women are are biologically the only part of the human race that's capable of bearing children. 
I'm going to make that assertion. I don't care if it's transphobic. Trans people don't exist. You can't, you're not trans. You're just a eunuch. Um, yeah, effeminate eunuchs um, from the men's side. So that's as far as I'm going to go with that. But yes, women are the only ones who are capable of reproducing the species. Right? Now, you need men, but women have children. And biologically, it is better for those children if they are raised by their mother and not by a hireling mother. Not by some supplemental mother while mom goes and actually fulfills her dreams. Well, have you thought about the children maybe? That maybe they have things that would be good for them and that maybe they're more important than your dreams? Good gravy. I mean, seriously, that's insanity to think that that your your visions of a prosperous life even even for your children, oh, I'm going to go raise money for them to have a better college education. What do, could you possibly be doing that will actually long-term benefit them more than being their mother? Seriously. Yeah, I'm getting biologically essentialist. I am. Partially because this is what the scriptures are going to encourage you to do. Check them out. And, I, and honestly, also, because I intend to honor the fact that my mother was a good mother. She educated me, and she raised me, and she had the um, intelligence to sometimes just let me go outside and run around in the wild and get in, pick fights with my brothers sometimes and get in trouble and you know, have to figure out how to get along with him. And, and honestly, I think part of it was just that with the uh, all the strong wills in my family that if she hadn't if she hadn't just let us run, she would have gone mad. But there was still wisdom involved there to know her own limitations and to know that it was okay for her to have those limitations and, and just let the kids be kids. Um, this was good. This was good. and and I, I respect the fact that my mother made that decision to be a mom. And my father did the, did his job by being a good father. Now, at, there was she did take a night job because we needed some supplemental income because we were poor, like really, really poor. Um, but I'm so glad that we were because that that lifestyle of being poor and eating what we could because we could and eating as well as we could afford. Um, that lifestyle was good, and the family was whole, and we developed a bond, a clan bond that that I wouldn't trade for anything else. And that can only happen when you have that proper proper relationship, that proper understanding of men and women. Um, and so, that's my dream for a society: is to actually be wholesome in that regard. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Sin, evil, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of things that that cause edge conditions. And if I make this outright, you will never have the society working with any women ever working. Well, no, obviously that's unreasonable. But to say this is good and you should strive for this in every single opportunity, you should always strive to let the women be at home raising their children. You should always strive to equip men to be good fathers and husbands because that's a good society. That's a good community. A good community does not say, well, we've got these opportunities for good men to be good men, but let's have a woman do that instead. Why? Because it's it's backwards. What does that say to the men? Well, you're great, but really we'd like a woman to do your job for you. And this gets to the whole Cantor issue. This gets to the Cantor issue. What is the first article reality, right? What does this mean? What is the way that nature is talking, right? What does nature confess when you've got a man lifting up his voice as a, you know, above others, right? That's what the Cantor job did was I was the only one singing at some point in the service. Now, it's possible that's a performance. It's also possible that that's leadership. And I would say if it's a performance, it's leadership in that context. That 
if I'm raising my voice above everyone else's and nobody else, everyone else is silent in this particular point in time, that means I'm the leader at that moment. Now, not not leader of the whole thing, obviously, right? But this is one of the reasons why if you if you go to the liturgy, right, the pastor sings alone. He's got things that he says to you. And it's great because he should, because he's your shepherd. He's the one to keep you in line. He's the, he's the guy there to guide you, lead you, shepherd you. So his voice should be above everyone else's. So here's the question. Why would it be okay for a single person in the congregation to raise up their voice? Or even a select group of people to raise up their voice as well? Representing the congregation, you could have a single voice. I think that's fair. I think that's okay. And again, this is voice. When you get to instruments, right? If you have if you have somebody playing the piano, right? Obviously, the person is playing, but the thing that's being raised up is the piano. Now, the skill of the person playing obviously matters, but the, it's not your actual voice. There's some there's some fudge factor there because you're dealing with technology. Technology dehumanizes the um, the content fundamentally, and sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's good. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter who's playing. Now, it does, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, so if you've got a single person lifting up their voice above everyone else's in the congregation, if you've got a single person effectively representing the common confession of the congregation with their voice, all saying, we believe this psalm, we're going to listen and, and, and in silent consent, uh, meditate on this, these words of Scripture as our confession, as our truth, as our, as our focus for the day, well, I would argue that good, proper order would imply you have a man do that. You have a man serve as head in this regard. Why? Because that's men's jobs. Because when a man leads, you're at least you're at least part way toward good order, right? You got to get a good man, and you have to have an honorable man. And the thing is, if my intentions in doing it are wrong, I need to stop. Not me, right? But find another man. Find another man who was willing to do it. Find older men. Find find an elder. I mean, for pity's sake, if you're going to have laymen serving you the uh, the Eucharist, assisting with the serving of the Eucharist, why not have them sing as representatives of the congregation? That just seems like good practice to me. Have your elders be your choir, be part of your choir. Make that part of your goal. Encourage them, equip them to raise up their voices as leaders. That seems like good first article reality to me. It does not seem like good first article reality to have the congregation represented by a woman, sung at, sung for by a woman in the common congregation. Why? Because then your men are getting led by a woman. And fundamentally, that's judgment. If you read the scriptures, when women are in charge, it's judging the men. It's because the men are awful. It's because the men are incompetent. It's because the men are incapable of leading. They are so bad. And so God judges the people by putting a woman in charge. That's how it works. So, think about it. That's all I'm asking. Think about it. Frankly, the, the, the lady who my pastor was suggesting was, she has a good voice. She really does. Um... It sometimes bothers me that she holds out longer than the organ, but I've just decided that that's, she's the echo, and it's beautiful. Um, she's our glorious little echo at the end of all the, all the pieces, and um, it's, kind of, it's kind of fun to have that. But that, I don't think it matters if you have a good voice. If, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clarify a point that I made uh, in the past, if the only qualification for singing in a church is that you have a good voice, hire some pagans. Hire some pagan men or pagan women to sing because you're probably going to find uh, more pagans out there with good voices than you are going to have people in your congregation. That's just a guess. It's just a guess. You can hire a pretty good pagan to sing pretty well for you. Um, but 
I don't think that's the only qualification. So you have to ask, what is the qualification? And it could be that you are a good Christian and you have a good confession and all this stuff. Yes, I would argue that if you're going to have it, you, you should also ask, is this congruent with your other vocations in life? Is it congruent with godly order? Is this congruent with a right confession to all the people in this congregation? If you're going to have one person singing solo, ask, do I want this? Do I want my congregation to look at this person as an example? As a um, as someone to look up to or to listen to in their other words? Um, now, it is possible, and, and in fact, it seems that in my own pride, I have I have taken up a little too much uh, ownership of that thing, and, and that was not actually meant. And and that's that's frustrating. That that it's frustrating to me that I fell under that because um, I really don't want that. I want to I want to keep my head firmly on the ground. Um, I'd rather not do it for pride. I like singing for people, though. I really do. I like. I talked about this last week, I think. Um, talk, I like singing like I mean it. I like singing so that others might actually hear the words and, and f- understand them. I like presenting the story of each hymn and each psalm, and I want to, I want to share that because it's awesome, because it's glorious. It is worth worthy of awe, and it is full of the glory of God. There we go. Yeah. Awesome and glorious. Um, it is, uh, it is a joy for me to serve in that capacity. Now, a wise man has told me that my pride is getting in the way of that. And I'm going to trust that he knows what he's talking about. My issue here is not that I think I'm so much better than anybody else. That's not my, my frustration. And it may, it may be a sinful thing that is in me and I wish to condemn it within my heart. My biggest problem, though, the reason for my shock, is that there's other good men there who should be equipped and pushed forward to sing. And you know what? One of them did while I was gone, while I was out of town, a good friend of mine. The only other man in the congregation who walks in without a mask stepped up to sing the intro it. And I'd say that matters. And that's good. And that that means something very, very important. I think that's good. I think that is good. And I, that's why one of the reasons I have hope for my congregation. Long term. Good men will step up. Good men will be making a bold confession, even over and against the world's pressures and false false idols good men will step up if you empower them and if you don't they'll find somewhere to step up and they'll build something good so empower them if you want your thing to endure empower the men make them stand encourage them equip them teach them give them an understanding the humiliation that they receive will come from the fact that they are, they're going to you know, fire at will at everything that comes their way. But just recognize that, yeah, yes, I need to recognize that I am a radical, crazy, energized with, with meat. And, you know, I have, I have a whole bucket of truth and I just want to like smack people in the face with it. Right? And sometimes I'm wrong. Yes. I can be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong on this one. And if I am wrong, I'd love to hear it in the comments. Please, share. Um, You're confessing something by how you do it. And I know that I need to get better at how I present my arguments before people. I know that in some contexts, being fervent and vigorous in how I present myself is off-putting. But frankly... I live in the middle of a matrilineal society, a, a society that, that operates based on softness, weakness, 
um, niceness, not kindness, nice. Don't cause, don't pick any fights, even if you need to pick the fight, right? It's nice to allow people or homosexual to feel like they're, they belong. It is not kind because it condemns them to hell. It is not kind to tell the homosexual that his homosexuality is okay. It is kind to tell him that it damns him to hell and he needs to repent of it. And kind to help him, to care for him, to love him, not to hate him for it, but to nonetheless be honest about it. Be honest about your own sin. That's kind. It's not nice, though. Not nice in the way that we think. We're not called to be nice. We're called to be kind and loving. And I intend to be kind and loving. I don't intend to follow the way that the rest of the world thinks, the way that the rest of the world operates. I intend to stand on conviction and truth and do so in the right way. This past couple of weeks, I've learned that I've learned that I need to temper my represent, my representations of my convictions in public. That I need to step back on the fervor of my belief and the energy behind it because it's off-putting to a matrilineal society that doesn't actually have convictions or whose convictions are oftentimes misled. Okay, that's fair. I'll work on that. But just notice, I'm learning. I'm going to keep learning. I'm going to keep studying. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm, I, I want to be wise. I want to be right. I want to be wise. I want to have the truth there. I intend to continue to work towards that. I ask you, join me. Join me in that crusade for truth, in the search, in the quest to hold to what is right and reprove me on those, on those grounds. But, but nonetheless, let's not waffle around. Let's not, let's not waver on our principles because a secular pagan world thinks that they're hateful. Let's rather continue in our convictions, continue strong in our convictions, knowing that our God is king. He alone is the judge. With him there is forgiveness, and therefore he may be feared. Let us fix our eyes on him, the author and perfecter, perfecter of our faith. Yes, yes, let us let us look there and not not waffle in not wallow in the muck of our own world to steal a phrase from someone else. Um, but rather let's let's stand for what's true. Let's look at what's true and look at what is good. What is good, regardless of whether or not it's comfortable. 